He is the assistant professor mathematics and school of physical science in Amritsar. And uh, he is also doing a lot of work in machine learning. And uh, we are fortunate to have him today um, for joining us and giving an amazing talk. Uh, so before going more details, uh, let me um, ask Pramod uh, to start giving his lecture. Welcome, Pramod. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, Pramod. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, let me share. Is my screen yeah, visible? Office. Yes, sir. Your screen is visible, sir. Yeah. You can continue. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, first of all, let me um, thank the organizers and especially Dr. Prashant for inviting me. Um, I'm basically a mathematician. So, after this talk by Dr. Daswin, who gave a broad um, uh, talk on AI, now my talk will be a bit more specific. And uh, since I'm not a biology person, I'll not go be going too deep into any of the biological aspects. I'll only be talking about some basic uh, uh, theoretical perspectives on um, the machine learning models. And uh, basically, it will be primarily about uh, some techniques which uh, we deal with in balanced data sets. So I thought that this would be useful uh, to people working in bioinformatics because my students, while annotating hypothetical proteins, they came up with this problem of uh, having very with them. So, without further ado, let me just start off. So, the topic uh, that I'm going to present is uh, imbalanced data sets in machine learning, its challenges and techniques. So, as I told you, this will be uh, very much specific. Um, and uh, I request all of you to please uh, uh, ask whatever questions you have. Okay, so what do you mean by a balanced data set? A balanced data set um, is, is a data set where you roughly have equal number of observations uh, for each of the instances or classes. Most of the data sets that we encounter are will be uh, almost balanced, say about six, um, 60, or 60 to 40 ratio and so on. And this will allow, when you model this data, it will allow us to uh, give an equal amount of, uh, the, due to this equal amount of data sets, your predictions will become more accurate. Now, what about unbalanced data? Unbalanced data sets are data sets where the observations uh, will be, uh, will have different, uh, will be, having what you say different number of class uh, instances in each of the classes and in such scenarios what happens is that the model is likely to be biased towards the majority class for example uh, here i have a picture of a data set which is highly imbalanced so what happens is that this blue dots which is the majority class uh, that constitutes about 98 percent of the labels and the minority class is just two percent so you can see that even uh, without a machine learning algorithm if i whenever i'm given a point if i classify it into uh, say the majority class there is a chance that i have a 98 percent accuracy so this is a great problem because most of the time what we We'll look into what are the challenges that we face theoretically and how we can overcome this. So uh, these are some of the examples that you have in real world scenarios. <clears throat> in uh, medical data sets, uh, when the number of patients with rare diseases has been uh, identified, you will see that it will be much uh, smaller than those without the disease. Uh, in finance data and all, uh, the number of uh, fraudulent uh, transactions 
will be very small when compared to non fraudulent transactions and the same case for bankruptcies also in marketing uh, you can see that uh, data from from customer responses the negative customer responses or the spam responses that is that is not uh, the responses that are manipulated will be very low uh, same thing with uh, physical phenomena if you are looking for uh, a magnitude of earthquakes in some particular region uh, you will see that the magnitudes uh, with very high impact will be considerably low so if you want to learn something about uh, the earthquakes of very high impact you will have very less data there so these are some real life situations there are lots and lots more uh, of them <clears throat> so now we'll move on to the challenges so what are the challenges that we face uh, when we deal with imbalanced data sets so uh, the basically imbalanced data sets means uh, uh, that the distribution of classes is highly skewed right so mathematically speaking the class distribution of each of these uh, uh, data data sets will be uh, very highly skewed towards the majority class so what happens in this uh, uh, high, when you run a model on this uh, highly skewed data set the predictive models they become very biased towards the majority class uh, and indeed the performance on the minority class which may be more important to us uh, will be very poor so this is one issue that we always face so to overcome this issue what we can do is we can go for Uh, machine learning or deep learning algorithms which will have more parameters right so once you go in with uh, deep learning techniques or techniques with more number of parameters what happens is that the uh, data tries to or the program uh, or the our model it tries to get overfitted so what is this overfitting problem it is actually that it will give you a good performance on the training data that you are doing but when you take a new data or a test data and you check its accuracy on the test uh, on the test data it will perform very poorly um, another problem uh, is that you will not be able to use each of the evaluation metrics matrices that you use for the prediction model here directly for example we saw in the first slide itself the accuracy is never reliable here because even if you uh, go for what you say the majority class uh, uh, for each of the instances you will see that you will get a very high accuracy so accuracy is never reliable here people will never go for the accuracy metrics when you are dealing with imbalanced data sets so what are the other options that we have then then uh, the other options are basically precision and recall so precision is actually uh, so i'll come to precision and recall with an example in the next slide so precision and recall also what happens here is that according to the program or the model that you are using and what output you need according to that you have to give more importance to whatever whichever one you want precision or a recall and further another evaluation metric like f1 scores or uh, the area under the curve of the roc curve uh, is will also be misleading many of the times this uh, f1 score is basically the harmonic mean of precision recall and roc curve uh, roc is uh, receiver of operating characteristic that is the full form of roc so this roc curve uh, it is actually a graphical representation of the performance uh, of binary classifiers where you actually plot the true positive uh, true positives and uh, against the uh, false positives so we'll come to this in the next slide we'll just see with an example so this is an example uh, so you consider a, a very highly imbalanced data set here uh, with around 95000 instances so your observation you have around 95000 observations here and the majority class is containing around 94900 and something so that means almost 100% of the data is from the majority class 
and the minority class is having just 32 instances so this is this can be an example of uh, what you say uh, a case where you are dealing with some rare disease right very rare disease so here basically what we will do will not directly not go with the accuracy of the model so suppose you uh, train this for a model and this is this uh, is the confusion matrix that you get so what do you mean by a confusion matrix it is a confusion matrix for a binary class problem here we will only be dealing with binary class problems is uh, uh, a set of four values or it is a matrix that consists of four values basically tp which is the true positive this is the number of values that are correctly classified the number of positives that are correctly classified here we are taking the mi minority class as the positive class and the majority class as the negative class so true positive is uh, tp or true positive is actually the uh, number of data points that is the positive data points which are correctly classified and true negative is actually tn uh, true negative is the number of uh, negative data points which are correctly classified now false positive is actually the number of point or uh, true point or uh, positive points which are wrongly classified and false negative is similarly the number of uh, negative data points which are falsely uh, classified so while running an algorithm suppose uh, you get your confusion matrix in this form 32 508 and 94500 uh, uh, approximately so here you see that the accuracy accuracy is calculated by taking the sum of the blue um, boxes divided by the total number of instances so you will see that uh, the misclassified numbers are just around 510 so remaining all the instances from the 95000 classes are correctly classified so that will give you an accuracy of almost 99.46 right but suppose you are dealing with uh, a rare disease and you want to you are instead looking forward to uh, find the people with the rare disease then this accuracy will not do anything for us right so it doesn't mean anything further uh, precision uh, this precision is actually giving you the uh, a percentage of how many of your uh, positive classes are correctly classified so it is actually a, the this precision value is actually 30 divided by the total uh, minority class. So 30 divided by 32, right? So uh, it, this precision is well and good here. That means the people who are having this rare disease are almost uh, all, almost all of them around 93% of them are correctly identified. But what about the recall? The recall is actually the ratio between the true positive and the false negative so it gives you this recall is very low means it it uh, what is what it does is actually that it is uh, showing that that the number of uh, people who do not have this rare disease are also being classified as people almost 508 people who do not have this disease are uh, being classified as people with the disease so this is very bad Right. So in instances where you go for rare diseases and all, you should go with the recall value. Right. So these uh, different scenarios, you will have to go with different values. Sometimes you will have to go with pre uh, the precision value and sometimes you will have to go with the uh, recall value. So this is just a small example. Now, once you have these challenges, uh, we have some basic preliminary uh, techniques to deal with most of these challenges so these uh, these uh, techniques are usually were usually developed in early 2000s and about till about 2010s and so on right so we'll just go into only the basics of them and later we have hybrid techniques uh, which will actually boost the accuracy of these algorithms now, when i talk about accuracy it is not just the accuracy it is the performance of the algorithm in base of whatever uh, matrices that you want so these are the basic techniques uh, they are roughly classified as uh, sampling techniques cost sensitive techniques 
uh, or cost sensitive learning techniques and ensemble methods ensemble methods are classical methods which can also be used for imbalanced data sets so um, in sampling we will have uh, basically under sampling and over sampling techniques uh, and in cost sensitive learning cost sensitive learning actually uh, will give some weights corresponding to the minority class so that it is the or it will actually penalize misclassification in the minority class so there are methods algorithmic methods that will uh, do that and ensemble methods what it does is it will um, what uh, it will combine a very weak or smaller algorithms in a weighted manner either sequentially or say in a parallel way uh, to get better accuracy uh, for the uh, model so we'll just uh, look into each of these uh, techniques in detail so random sampling techniques so basically random sampling techniques you will have two types of um, one is under sampling and one is over sampling so what is under sampling in under sampling we will reduce or remove the instances in the majority class to balance the data so uh, in doing so what happens is that we might lose very important data so usually random sampling techniques are not uh, widely used by themselves we uh, along with this random sampling techniques we also use some other cost sensitive or ensemble techniques to uh, get better results so on their own we don't use them so this uh, random under sampling also causes high variance to the uh, data because once you remove all the most of the majority class data the samples that are remaining may not represent the entire data set properly so that problem is there with random under sampling now what happens in random over sampling is that you replicate randomly replicate the minority class data so that it becomes balanced so here you have this overfitting problem the number of instances uh, becomes huge and then you have this overfitting problem uh, and once you have this overfitting problem you will always have a poor performance on the uh, unknown or new test data that you will see so to overcome these uh, random sampling techniques uh, we have got um, two specific um, sample techniques uh, one for under sampling and one for uh, over sampling so this tomic links is uh, is a very widely used under sampling technique uh, basically this is done only for uh, binary classification so what it does is that it is from the figure you can see what it will do is it will uh, find tomic links so what are these tomic links they are they are the values in the minority class or the points in the minority i mean majority class which lie very close to the minority class so you find out these tomic links the Uh, the points which are lying very close to the minority classes they are ambiguous or uh, noisy instances of the majority class so you remove them right so after removing the points which are close by very close to the minority class you will get a figure or you will get data like this so this is done iteratively under the un until your data becomes balanced so what are the drawbacks here this can be done only for two class problems so basically we are here dealing only with two class problems so that's why we i thought of uh, just going through this then another problem with this is that it will perform uh, very badly when you have extreme high bal uh, imbalances and your data points are highly overlapping so if if uh, the uh, minority class points they lie exactly inside the majority classes and uh, the imbalance is very high then the stomach links will not work properly the next uh, uh, method is an oversampling technique uh, called smote 
SMOT is synthetic minority over sampling technique. So here what is being done is that you synthetically, uh, you create synthetic instances or instances which are not actually there in the uh, data set. So uh, uh, in random oversampling, what you will do is you will just uh, replicate or duplicate the data. Here, uh, basically what you are doing is you are synthetically generating instances of the minority class. So for doing this, what uh, what is done is that you find out for corresponding to each of the minority class uh, instance, you will find its k nearest neighbors. And from among one of the k nearest neighbors, you will randomly select one of the k nearest neighbors. And you will add synthetic instances in between the point and the neighbor right so this is basically called interpolation so you add uh, n number of synthetic instances between the point and its near and one of its nearest neighbors so this is done for each of the uh, classes or each of the instances from the minority class and thus what happens is that the uh, in doing so with uh, a specific number of uh, the parameter say the nearest neighbor should be classified properly here the number of instances that you want to add should be given properly and in doing so what happens is that this data becomes balanced so here this user defined parameters are very important like uh, nearest neighbor uh, and also the number of data or instances that you have to add so here also you have got this uh, drawbacks, uh, the common drawbacks of oversampling techniques like overfitting. It also increases the computational cost of the algorithm because the data points will become highly, uh, I mean, the number of data points will become very high. And uh, another problem with this mainly is that this cannot be used for categorical data. You can use this only for uh, numerical or uh, continuous data points. Like categorical data, data like uh, uh, where you have one class to be the set of all dogs and another class to be the set of all cats. So there you cannot actually interpolate between values and give different cats or dogs in the middle. Right? So there are different pro uh, techniques by which you can convert this categorical data to uh, continuous form data and then you can add them. That is always possible. Now, the next thing, uh, is the cost uh, sensitive learning techniques. So here, basically what you will do is you will give some cost for misclassification or you will create a penalty uh, for the misclassification from class to class. So for, for the majority class and the minority class, especially for the minority class, you will give a, the weights or cost of penalizing uh, the misclassification you will be increasing very much. So the different techniques here is first one is assigning these to the class weights itself. So what happens is that uh, in the loss function, when you generate the predictive model in the loss function itself, you assign some weights to uh, the loss function corresponding to the minority class. So, so uh, two very commonly used weighting techniques are given here. One is the inverse frequency rate weighting technique where you Assume that the weight that you are going to multiply with the loss function for the minority class is log capital N by small n, where capital N is the total number of instances and small n is the number of instances in the minority class. Similarly, another weight is the square root frequency weighting. So where you take the square root of n by a. So giving weights to the loss function is one category of cost sensitive learning. Another uh, cost-sensitive learning technique is to use cost-sensitive algorithms. Cost-sensitive learning techniques directly in the learning process. So in each of the iterations, it will develop these weights by themselves and uh, penalize the misclassification and errors themselves. So this is one. Uh, technique or 
this cost sensitive uh, algorithm techniques is very widely used and it has been combined with other techniques to give you very good results uh, the next one is threshold moving so this is a little tricky one so what you do here is that if you have a binary classification you usually uh, give the threshold value to be 0.5 assuming that 0.1 is 1 i mean 0 is your uh, negative uh, prediction and 1 is your positive prediction uh, sir uh, sorry to interrupt you uh, yes. you just got another 3 uh, uh, to 5 minutes you can wind up okay 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 fine yes. sorry yeah thank you thank you so much okay so um, here um, in this uh, threshold moving what you will see is that you will give in uh, a more weight towards the minority class by moving the threshold from 0.5 to say 0.7 or 0.8 but the problem with this threshold moving is that it will reduce the overall accuracy of your uh, model so to look into this and to uh, stick on to the overall accuracy what you can do is you can go for some trial and then methods in moving the threshold and each time you will plot this roc curve uh, and see which threshold is better for you so just a trial and error and a method will be uh, applicable here now this is the last technique that we will be discussing uh, this is ensemble method they are classical techniques that has been used for uh many many uh, decades now so what what is done here is that this uh, technique is to combine predictions from simple models and improve the overall performance so basically there are two types of ensemble models one is uh, ensemble models that work in parallel and the other is that work sequentially so the ones that work in parallel are called the bagging techniques so here in the bagging technique what you will do is you will uh the models so the simple models are trained on random data uh, random subsets of the data set uh, and this with replacement is important so what in imbalanced data cases what we will do is that we will uh, take more instances of the uh, minority class and less instance of the majority class so that your data can become uh, balanced and each of the subsets will, will be balanced and then you will perform this bagging technique so this uh, this is it has been theoretically shown that bagging will reduce the variance of the uh, overall um, model boosting is another technique when will train on multiple models sequentially and in in training when you train the first one and get a uh, to get a classification accuracy you will see what is the misclassification instances and give some weights according to the misclassification instances so that they are corrected uh, in the second um, or the second iteration or the second model uh, so this is the method that you use for boosting uh, a very common boosting technique is the ada boost technique so most all of you who have worked on basic machine learning models uh, will be familiar with the ada boost technique so the other um, uh, ensemble method that we did basically use basically ensemble methods are used on decision trees that is how they started off this way nowadays you can use ensemble methods on almost uh, all the with this high end computers and things like that you can use on ensemble methods on almost uh, all the predictive models so this uh, ensemble with with decision trees is very uh old fashions but it will give you very good results so two specific examples is one is the xg boost which uh, which will uh, combine boosting and regularization together as you know regularization is giving weight to, uh, in some way to the uh, cost function you have basic regularization like l1 l2 lasso i, I hope many of you have heard about lasso regularization and risk regularization so on and the next technique is the random forest and which is a bagging technique along with the random feature selection of the decision tree so uh, random feature selection um, is basically a random uh, selecting the random subset of features uh, each time before training the model so so i'll conclude by just uh, 
going through what all things mm -hmm. we just said. So the data imbalance negatively uh, affects the performance of the machine learning model that we have already seen from the confusion metrics and the evaluation uh, metrics that we take. So basically what you have to do is you have to choose the right technique and that this right technique will depend on the, what type of classification distribution you are having for your data. So depending on the data set that you have, you have to choose the right technique for this uh, balancing. And further, depending on the problem of interest, uh, you have to choose an appropriate evaluation metric. So one technique depends on the class distribution, choosing the technique and choosing the evaluation metric will depend on the uh, problem of interest that you are uh, taking. Now, apart from these uh, very simple techniques that we discussed today, today uh, there are very good uh, hybrid balancing techniques that uh, are very common in literature. So what they'll do is they'll leverage the strength of each of these techniques to overcome the limitations of the other. So examples are Smart Boost, uh, Smart Tomic, uh, uh, this is RUS is nothing but uh, random undersampling boost. Easy ensemble. This easy ensemble is a very good technique. What it does is it will, uh, this algorithm will uh, combine multiple subsets of the majority class with the entire minority class. So each uh, subset will have the entire minority class and equally balanced the majority class and then ensemble techniques are done on them. The other one is Cure, which is very commonly used. Cure is an algorithm which will first sample your, it is an undersampling technique. What it will do is it will uh, cluster the data points in, in the mi majority class using some standard cluster algorithms like K-means algorithm and it will then take only the centroids or the midpoints of these clusters and remove all the other, uh, uh, what do you say, the majority class instances. Uh, these are some of the references that I have used. Uh, the fourth one, the paper by he and Garcia, this is one of, uh, known to be one of the uh, basic papers that you can go for when you are looking into learning from imbalanced data. This paper, if you go through the, uh, go to the uh, Google Scholar and check, you will see that it all, it has almost 8,000 to 9,000 citations. The other ones will contain all the majority of the uh, things that we have talked about here. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank questions. you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so the session is open now for question answers. So participants can unmute yourself and ask your questions here. Uh, yeah, sir. So I just had uh, some question like, uh, uh, so all this, uh, uh, the like, like this imbalance on data sets that you discussed, sir. So yeah. like, uh, it is applicable for in each uh, subjects. Like I'm saying, like, is it it is from physical science or any chemistry background or any other was trying to apply this and uh, trying to know about this techniques. It, it is applicable for irrespective of any subjects, sir. Yes, yes, surely. Uh, we have been working uh, on this uh, technique, uh, imbalance technique, when we, uh, when some of my students have done this uh, annotations on, um, what do you say, uh, hypothetical proteins, where you see that uh, we took around 40,000 uh, samples of hypothetical proteins and then uh, we saw that uh, a special category will have only four or five of these proteins that will annotate to that class, right? So from this 40,000, maybe 10 or 12 uh, will be classified to the positive class and then the others don't have this property. So when you are working with models like this, uh, you actually have to go into this uh, balancing technique and then only you can work with this. Otherwise, your program will give you very poor performance. Yeah, so thank you so much. Apart yes, yes. from biology, everywhere you can use this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank you, sir. Ashish Gaur, uh, yeah, you can unmute yourself and uh, please ask your question. Uh, good, good morning, sir. Sir, as uh, I want to know that uh, I am working on image processing. So, 
whenever we talk about the sample selection or the data set preparation in the field of bio we have some good algorithms or some tools to identify or to decide what should be the sample size but in the case of ai whenever i applied ai then which tool should i go for the to decide that what should be the sample size or my data set is fixed or is it it will not be overfitted or overwhelmed so what should we i do or uh, what type of tools should i go for like uh, what are you working on basically you are working uh, on image right data i am working on image processing for the identity uh, artificial intelligence based solutions for the fico remediation so you are working basically on image de- images right image processing yeah yeah so your input will be images right yeah That microscopic images uh, so images uh, microscopic image what what uh, i haven't worked on microscopic images uh, but uh, what are what is the dimension or size of these microscopic images that 200 into 200 pixel and 3 ei i have taken actually i have taken the 90000 pictures sometimes i have taken the five fold classification so that time i reduced that to, so i still confused after so many publications that uh, how can we decide that this should be the size of my sample is good because in the field of biology we have the stat no calculate. no there is no hard and fast rule for that okay so basically um, it, it depends on what instances you have what what is the type of uh, problem that you are facing or how you want to uh, or what is the what is your actual problem so if you are if you are want to categorize something into some category uh, okay the best thing that you have to do is you have to get enough number of samples from those category okay so once you get that then only you can work with it and get a good algorithm okay sir one last question is uh, if i have a small data set and i go for the data augmentation okay is it ethical to increase the size of little bit data to at that level or to use that data for the training and the validation purpose is it ethical or it will be questionable in the future no data augmentation is done most of the time right uh, okay. so this is also problem specific basically you, data augment we you can always work with small data but uh, the as i told you this sampling or you basically what you want to do is over sampling from what i understand right oh, okay so yes. if you want to go for over sampling techniques you uh, you should be sure that you are the data that you are over sampling or augmenting uh, yeah. is giving you a correct uh, representation of the original data set so okay. that will come only from uh, that is not a machine learning technique or this thing that will come only from your expertise okay. once you can do that then you can always work with it there is no problem okay thanks thanks thank you participants uh, thank you sir for taking the pain and uh, uh, giving such wonderful talk sir we really uh, have enjoyed the your talk sir uh, now uh, we shall have a photo session with you sir that will be a great opportunity yes, for all of us rasul uh, and i request all the participants to switch on their webcam to have a group photo thank you sir thank you sir for joining now we shall proceed with the next session uh, so we can have you, in ready can you give you a few minutes break uh, because um, the sure, participants sure. also will be tired after a continuous yeah, uh, continuous uh, talks we okay, give you a yeah, 5 yeah. minutes break uh, until yeah. another 5 minutes which is going to be uh, india time uh, 11 